is just fantastic. Captain Zog, subdate 20922.4. I have just received word from the penitentiary where my ISO cubes are held that a very special guest is arriving. This gentleman in question was my own MP. Oh boy, this is going to be interesting. Welcome everyone to the 42nd Halls of Injustice. This one is a rather special one to me, because the person in question I have a connection with via this letter. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the letter. I'm sure if you paused it long enough, you could read it and understand he was instrumental in helping. The person in question was so instrumental in assisting my family that he had, in my eyes, earned my vote in 2017. The man in question is called Charlie Elphick, and he was my member for Parliament from 2010 till 2019, when he resigned and was replaced by his wife, now ex-wife. Because of the nature of this video and the length it could well be, it will be broken down. We are going to have an introduction now to Charlie Elphick, a timeline of what happened that got him into trouble, the court case itself, and the sentence and subsequent fallout. Because there has been some, and it is quite fascinating. In 1994, Charlie Elphick started his political career when he was elected to the Lambeth London Borough Council, representing Gypsy Hill. In 1998, he stood down and became chairman of the Dulwich and West Norwood Conservative Association, and served until he was selected for the Conservative Parliamentary Candidate for St Albans in 1999. He was not elected for that particular seat. So instead, he was made Deputy Chairman of the Cities of London and Westminster Conservative Association from 2002 to 2006. In 2007, Charlie Elphick was selected as a Conservative candidate for Dover. This was one of Labour's safest seats in Kent. In 2010, he took it with a 10.4% swing. Since 2010, he was re-elected in 2015 and in 2017. In 2012, Charlie Elphick stood for the post of Secretary of the 1922 Committee, but he was defeated. In October 2012, Downing Street announced Charlie Elphick as the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Minister for Europe, then going on to become the Parliamentary Private Secretary to Ian Duncan Smith for the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. He then went on to become Government Whip, a Lord Commissioner, or Lord of the Treasury, following the 2015 election, but was sacked in 2016 when Theresa May replaced David Cameron as Prime Minister. In 2016, Charlie Elphick campaigned to remain in the European Union, but over the course of his parliamentary career, he voted for referendums on the UK's membership to the EU, on multiple occasions in fact. And when the country and his constituency voted to leave, he campaigned on the side of leave to ensure that we left, with him contributing to Theresa May's government's first defeat over Brexit legislation in December of 2017. As the rest of his parliamentary career concerns the crimes he commits as well, we are now going to move on to what he was accused of and how this impacted his career. As he's already in the ISO cubes, we can safely say it ended quite poorly for the <clears throat> naughty Tory Charlie Elphick. One of the first accusations to arise came from 2007, three years before he was elected as MP for Dover, where it was alleged by a lady that he had brought her to his home in London, plied her with a £40 bottle of alcohol, and while she thought him to be a bit asexual, he started to talk to her about her sexual preferences, with him continuing to talk about silk, leather, bondage, getting a tad excited about this. It was alleged that afterwards, he had pounced on her, trying to kiss her, and then groping her breast, with her then running away, and him chasing her around the house saying, I'm a naughty little Tory. The second allegation comes six years into his time as an MP, where he and another woman found themselves sharing a bottle of champagne in Westminster, with the victim claiming that he tried to kiss her before groping, 
with him repeating a similar sentiment to the first one. Oh, I'm naughty sometimes, aren't I? I can be so badly behaved, but I can't help it. This is all alleged, by the way. In 2017, these allegations came to light, and he was, because of this, suspended from the Conservatives and had his whip removed. But because of a no-confidence vote in Theresa May, he had his whip restored, so that he could vote in favour of keeping Theresa May on. In 2018, when the charges went a little bit further courtesy of the Crown Prosecution Services, because they had looked at the file from the Metropolitan Police, he was formally charged and suspended again. In 2019, Charlie Olphick decided it was the right move to stand down, and his wife, who is very well qualified to operate as an MP in his stead, took over. Her experience is working with homelessness and housing associations, and various charities for that matter, make her an ideal candidate when housing in this area is a big problem. Because of this, Charlie Olphick's political career ended, which is a good thing because we'll get to him being in the isocubes again momentarily. So now we should move on to the trial itself, because this one took a while, and it took a while because of COVID-19, but also a few other issues arose, and it's worth addressing those as well. Surprise, motherfucker! <laughs> the trial began on July 7th, 2020, with both victims using video link to give evidence in court. The first from 2007 said he started talking about what we liked in a sexual way. I sort of wagged my finger at him and said we don't need to talk about that kind of thing. He was like a totally asexual person to me. He was jovial, jokey, excited maybe in an animated way. I was just thinking, oh god, how embarrassing. And that after a couple of sentences, he basically jumped on her to grope her breast, tried to kiss, and then the cringy, I'm a naughty Tory. The second victim found herself in Charlie Othick's company and shared a bottle of champagne in Westminster, saying that he had tried to kiss her before groping her, and that his mouth was opened, continually trying to kiss her. It was like a disgusting, slobbery mess. One of the things that got this ball moving was that in 2017, there was a publication of a list of MPs alleged to have acted inappropriately. Charlie Elphick was on the list because of the incident in 2016, which encouraged the young lady from 2007 to come forward. In 2017, a UK tabloid called The Mirror had originally made an offer to the first lady that he assaulted, allegedly. This was after she had contacted them. She ended up backing out of the offer and instead went to the police because she felt that would be the more appropriate way of dealing with this. There was also the worry that had this gone public through a newspaper that perhaps it would have led to a similar incident to that of the Welsh Assembly politician, former, called Carl Sargent, who when accusations arose about his behaviour, he took his life. So there was a worry there as well. The woman he assaulted allegedly in 2016 was told by Charlie that he had not been happy in his marriage for years when he had been questioned about being married, with him also trying to get her to not speak, to not blab, because he didn't want to risk damaging his marriage. With her saying to him, this was not okay. With him saying, why not? She replied, you're married, to which he said he hadn't been for years. Defending Charlie Elphick, Ian Winter QC, read sections of text messages between the client and the woman in the lead-up to the first alleged incident, describing them as frisky and flirty, with him also accusing her of errors in her recollections to the police. This is, to me, all quite important and does lead to many believing this could be argued to be victim-blaming. I would say for the sake of it, his job as defending is to poke holes where there might be a hole. Going back to the first victim, Charlie Elphick actually paid her £5,000 just so that his wife wouldn't find out, paying her £500, £1,000 in odd bits here and there because he didn't want Natalie Elphick 
to find out. When taking the stand, Charlie Elphick was asked to explain what had happened, and he said, The atmosphere was very warm and convivial, and I believed she wanted to take matters further. I leaned over and kissed her. At first, she responded positively. Then it became clear it was not what she wanted. He then continued saying, I was incredibly apologetic. I believed this was what she wanted. She said she accepted my explanation, my apology, and that I had been under misapprehension. Things get a little murky here now, because Charlie Elphick got caught out, not just with that, but also because he had to admit he did not tell the police the truth when they asked him about one of the women he is accused of sexually assaulting, with his excuse being he feared it would destroy his marriage. I'll be honest. You destroyed your marriage years ago, but sure. He also admitted to covering up, or trying to, separate affairs with another woman who is not one of the two complainants for very similar reasons. Well, that's what most people do when they try and hide an affair, isn't it? So when the police interviewed him, they asked him if he had feelings for the complainant. So he said, I didn't know how to explain it to Natalie Elphick. It was an emotional attachment. I think she'd be very hurt, and I didn't want that. I thought that. I didn't know how to tell Natalie I had developed an emotional attachment. I thought she'd be very hurt, I had lost my head. I didn't want to put my marriage in jeopardy, and it would cause chaos. So he had to also admit he had signed an incorrect statement given to the police in January 2020, when he said he had not made advances towards the complainant with him acknowledging it as not true, saying, I had dug myself into such a big hole. I didn't know how to get out of it. It was a terrible mistake. I am sorry. I should have not lied to the police. I should have just fronted it up. I should have told the truth rather than half the truth. It should be noted for the sake of it, Charlie Elphick only changed his defence when it comes to how he is defending himself within this case after a chat. I'm sure a lovely, polite, kind, and totally not one person screaming at the other with Natalie Elphick. No doubt she was uber polite during this whole proceeding when her, um, dear, dear Charlie, the naughty Tory, had to own up to all his cock-ups. To her, at least. It was noted by the prosecutor that there was a remarkable similarity in both cases from 2007 and 2016. It should also be noted the 2016 incident happened twice. Yes, turns out old Charlie couldn't help but go back for more. In closing statements, Ian Winter, after quoting Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, told jurors, Fools are as Shakespeare said in Twelfth Night, like husbands as pilchards are to herrings. The husband's the bigger fool. You might think that at the heart of this case lies a very ancient foolishness of husbands. If Mr. Elphick was on trial here for behaving foolishly, you might find it easy to convict. If Mr. Elphick was on trial for cheating on his wife, treating her badly, you might find it easy to convict. You may despise that level of low morality, but you put that to one side. He is on trial for sexually assaulting two women. That is the allegation. With the prosecutor, Eloise Marshall QC, saying, Charlie Elphick is an accomplished liar, and he assaulted these women in exactly the way they described. He is guilty of all three counts on this indictment, and you can be sure of that. It's worth noting Jess Phillips risked contempt of court by tweeting about the evidence during the trial, where she quote tweeted a press report that was entitled XMP Charlie Elphick told women she had led him on assault trial hears. With her replying to that, this account does nothing to diminish his behavior. Rule of thumb for me is always look where the power lies. Was he ever naughty with women more senior than him? People tend never to grope someone who can sack them. Can you imagine the ball ache it would have caused? had she have been done for contempt of court. I think it's now time we get to the verdict, as this part's my favourite part. Throughout the entire trial, Charlie Elphick's wife, Natalie, had been with him 
through all of this. She was there for every single court date. She made it a point to be by his side, even on the day of this verdict. But before he was given his verdict, he and his wife Natalie Elphick had a private ten-minute meeting alone, at the end of which Natalie Elphick left and went by taxi to, at the same time, tweet out, Today's verdict is one that brings profound sorrow. It ends my 25-year marriage to the only man I have ever loved. I would ask for some personal space and time to come to terms with the shocking events of the last three years. I will not be commenting further. It turns out Natalie Elphick only found out about the actual affair he had when she went through the case files for all of this, because he still hadn't told her. That deception, which while bringing a tear to Charlie's eye in court because he thought his marriage was on its last thread and he needed to save it, was in fact the straw that broke the camel's back. So Charlie Elphick, via a unanimous vote of the jury, was found guilty of all three charges of sexual assault. Speaking after the verdict, Metropolitan Police Detective Sergeant Michael McKearney, who gave evidence during the trial, said that these were alarming, distressing incidents for both women, and I would like to acknowledge their courage in reporting the incidents and cooperating with the police investigation. Elphick was persistent in his sexual advances and showed a lack of self-restraint and regard for the women whose emotional well-being and professional lives were affected by what happened. Victims of non-recent sexual offences should not be deterred from reporting what happened to them to the police. Specially trained investigators will investigate the claims and seek prosecutions where possible, whilst providing all necessary support for victims. As there was a six-week gap between verdict and sentencing, the judge did tell him, You're looking at jail time, Charlie. Yes, they're going to pass you around like a joint. Okay, the last part was made up, but I thought it was funny. So with the verdict out of the way, we should skip ahead six weeks to the sentence. Charlie Elphick, former MP for Deal and Dover from 2010 to 2019, was sentenced to two years in jail after being found guilty of three counts of sexual assault against two women. We have gone through the types of sexual assault in question, so it is understandable that the sentence is not longer, but it is worth noting, based on sentencing guidelines, it's a little bit longer than what it would have been, something which his ex-wife was quick to point out. But before we get into that part, I thought I'd read one of the victim impact statements read out in court during the sentencing. The one that worked as a parliamentary worker that Charlie took advantage of twice said that she felt helpless, depressed, beaten, vulnerable, and constantly scared. This is my attempt to articulate the lasting impact he has had on me. The other woman, from 2007, said that as a result of her ordeal, she suffered increased anxiety when meeting any man. Being quoted as saying, I feel like things I once enjoyed have been taken away from me. After being led from the docks into custody, a statement was read out that was Charlie Elphix via a spokesperson that said two weeks ago my legal team sought to leave to appeal my conviction to the Court of Appeal. That application is made on a number of grounds which demonstrate that my trial was unfair and my conviction unsafe. I know that I am innocent of any criminal wrongdoing and will continue to fight to clear my name. This was when his now ex-wife said that the sentence was a bit much, along with the trial as well being unfair. The sentence based on the guidelines is excessive, but I actually understand why, because they've left out a charge they could have hammered him on, and that was the part where he signed statements that were lies. He was always going to be found guilty because he never told the truth from the offset, meaning any statement he made during the trial would have been dismissed, because he is a liar. Therefore, while it is admirable he intends to appeal this, it is going to be incredibly difficult for him to do so. Charlie Elphick will serve about a year of that sentence, the remainder of which will be spent on license, 
and unless he manages to successfully appeal, it is unlikely he'll ever amount to anything after this. So the final thing I want to address now then is the fallout, because there are some rather interesting articles that have been circulating that add to this but also paint a damning picture of Parliament. The first interesting piece of fallout came courtesy of a number of hashtags that were doing their rounds. The one that was connected to Charlie was hashtag Tory Rapist. Interestingly, it was only a few weeks earlier that another Tory Rapist hashtag was trending, but as that was related to an unnamed Tory MP, we have nothing to go on. It just points out there is still some shenanigans going on in Parliament. Next would be that the naughty Tory Charlie Elphick's marital home was put up for sale for $1.4 million. It's been sold. It's a lovely home. I rode past it a few weeks ago. <laughs> it's quite nice. I'm a tad curious to see how much of that he gets to keep. Yes, a little. As he has a home also in London. Yes, we do have to wonder. Next, there were two other articles. One was written by Tim Shipman. This was before the sentencing, but it was quite interesting to me nonetheless. This one centred around the fact that clearly Charlie Elphick knew what he had done, and this was from Tim's perspective. He was acting, Charlie that is, as if he had done nothing wrong. His behaviour, his mannerisms, his attitudes were of somebody who was trying to fob it off. How very grown up of him. I will link the article down below. The final article is a somewhat food for thought, because Parliament is still failing. They've had many scandals over the years. Some we can certainly ignore because of certain arcane laws that prevented relationships of a certain variety. The report into improper conduct that came out with a list of names of MPs that had taken advantage or had misused their positions, yeah, nothing really happened of that. In fact, it seemed to have been brushed under the rug as well, which is quite strange. So the article by Gabby Hinsliff is quite fascinating. As a final opinion when it comes to Charlie Elphick, you, Charlie Elphick, were my MP. You were trusted by so many of us because you did in fact do what was right by us. You disagreed with us, but when we voted against you, you took our side. Brexit is the best example of that. And you voted to give us that right to vote as well which is incredibly important. But even before you were an MP and during your time at the pinnacle of your career, you took advantage of people that you should never have taken advantage of. And because you lied before you even got into the court, you were always going to fall hard. I don't know how you're going to pick yourself up, but I sorely doubt you'll be welcomed anywhere within the very constituency you claim to love. I know this was a lot longer than usual for a Halls of Injustice, but this one was a tad personal to me, and I hope you understand that. I hope everyone listening has a fantastic Tuesday, and thank you all for listening. Thank you.